Hello, everybody. I'm Michael Sag. I'm a physician at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I am an infectious disease doctor. My main work has been in HIV and AIDS going back to the 1980s. And then more recently, uh, I've gotten involved in hepatitis C and very recently into COVID. So I'm, I'm used to working in epidemics and syndromes of sorts. And so it was a real joy for me to watch a syndrome and a plague actually be non-existent. Um, and I had not heard of Syndrome K before uh, I saw the movie or heard about the film festival's production of this movie. So it's, it's really kind of fun for me to look at this. And I'm especially pleased um, to be here with Stephen Edwards, who's, as you know, at this point is the director of this wonderful film. And so Stephen, welcome, glad you're here. Nice, nice being here. Thank you for having me. Sure. So, you know, I guess every I'm trying to think about what the first thing that I thought of when I first heard about this, and that is, how did you hear about Syndrome K? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I actually found out about it completely by accident when a friend of mine posted a, a meme about it on Facebook. Uh, and I, you know, that... It's like one of those life-changing events, like when you meet your wife or when your first child is born. And when I saw that meme for this thing, this fake disease called Syndrome K, I said, oh, this looks like a fascinating subject. And I immediately went to Amazon and Netflix and tried to find a documentary about it because I was absolutely certain the story was just too good yeah. that there has to be a documentary out there. And this is like, this is a span of, you know, three minutes. Wow. So I did a, you know, a, a, a frantic search on 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 Netflix, a frantic search on, you know, all the streamers and I couldn't find anything. I couldn't believe it. I was, I was just shocked. So, you know, the, my brain started turning very quickly and, w you know, within a minute or two, I was like, oh, this is my next project. Wow. And the irony is my first project was um, a documentary called Requiem for My Mother, which was a story about a piece of music I wrote for my mother when she died of cancer in 2006. Mm -hmm. And it's also shot in Vatican City because it's a story of an American choir that rehearsed in the United States, got together in the United States, and then flew to Vatican City and, and premiered it at a, uh, a music festival there called Musica Sacra. So it was kind of ironic that my second project also takes place within, you know, a kilometer of where my first movie took place. And I had no idea, you know, I never thought I'd be a guy making a Holocaust doc in right. my wildest dreams, just because I thought most of the stories have been told. And I'm fascinated by World War II, always have been. I had a, my, my, um, my uh, great uncle was, or sorry, my godfather was uh, a, a pilot, a U.S. pilot that was based in Berlin, or sorry, based in uh, London, flew missions over Germany and uh, survived 25 missions. Um, okay. So I have a lot of World War II people in my family. So you had your Lin Manuel Miranda moment. Uh, he came up with the idea for Hamilton about halfway through the first chapter of reading the book on vacation and said, "Oh, somebody's had to have done something with this," and found out that they hadn't. Um, Hundred percent. Yeah. So my question, I guess, the next is: so you get this inspiration, you start moving forward, you start doing some research. What was your process? How did you start learning more about it? How did you? Um, and I'll get all, and then you might as well segue into how you started constructing the outline for the project and gaining the, the documentary footage. Well, the first thing I thought of was, okay, how do you make a film about this if there's no film, if there's nothing there? Because so I, you know, I was kind of naive as to, you know, the, the prevalence of um, archives. And we used archives from Italy, uh, UK, France, and United States military archive. Um, so the first thing I did was I started doing web searches about the three doctors. So Dr. Borromeo was the head doctor of the hospital. He was born in the 1890s. He died in 1961. So I found a date of death of him. There's no film of him. There's maybe four or five pictures that exist anywhere. And there's, you know, a Wikipedia page and that's it. And then Dr. Sacher Doty, who was the Jewish doctor practicing under a fake identity at a hospital, literally under the nose of the Nazis. Um, that's when it started to get really interesting because the first place I went was the Shoah Foundation, for those of you who don't know, which I'm sure everybody knows, is a treasure trove of testimonials of um, people who survived not only World War II, but also Rwanda. There's other genocides 
beside Steve Spielberg inspired thing. Spiel, Spielberg founded it and it's here at USC. So it's literally 12 miles from my house in Los Angeles. So I got to be friends with a guy called Crispin there. And I said, Crispin, do we have anything on this Dr. Sacerdoti? Well, turns out there was a, there was a show a crew in Rome in 1998. They found Dr. Sacerdoti and they interviewed him. And that's the interview of Dr. Sacerdoti. It's the and only film of him. Wow. So that's, those are those clips we saw in the film. Yep. Was that, wow. Yep. Fascinating. And so I don't know if you remember, there was Dr. Sacerdoti and there was another na lady named Leah Danola and there's sure. another lady named uh, Amalgia. So Amalgia is his cousin and I've got film of them sitting together waiting for the other one to be interviewed. So they did the interview on the same day, somewhere in 98 or 99. Wow. So once we had Sacerdoti's testimony and he's talking about being a Jew and Roman Jew and hiding it like the story just kept getting better and better mm -hmm. then i looked for dr osacini and he was born in 21 and i couldn't find a date of death of him like there was no death notice no obituary and i was like that's weird you know it's almost 100 years ago so i called a woman who's a jewish journalist who's based in rome um her family's been in rome for over 2,000 years and i said hey you know she's a friend of a friend one of my executive producers and i said hey you know can you find me some people to interview she goes well, how about Dr. Ozzuccini? And I said, what? And she said, oh, he's still alive. He's 98 years old. I said, you have to be kidding me. Mm. So I booked the next flight, hired a crew, and we sat down. And it, I mean, there's so much serendipity because, you know, he's 98 years old, uh, you know, and they said, you know, we're going to book a day to interview him, but he might be having a bad day. He might just cancel on you. And I had a short window to be in Rome. So he was great. He was obviously full of, you know, vinegar, as you saw from the interview. Yeah. yeah had the edge and uh and then we interviewed the two roman jews who were survivors as well so on that same trip we caught the the two survivors the um sunino brothers not brothers they're same last name but they're like distant cousins right and then we got Ozzuccini. and now we had you know and then we got borromeo's son who was also interviewed so we did four interviews in a couple days yeah wow that's awesome and his his perspective from 98 years at that time of living and i saw i heard at the end that he had passed away in 2019 is that right that's correct he died on my birthday whoa um that's, both. if you say in the jewish world that's Bashar of sorts mm -hmm. that's a sort of fate so the the thought then is um just listening to him he he boiled everything down to these straightforward statements like bravery always wins and right. things like that that i just thought were so cool because it's not it's not it's not convoluted it's not long-winded it's just that eh, bravely bravery always wins and you know think about it these guys didn't go around crowing about how great they were no right didn't, you know didn't show off about it and there's so little information about it it's just it's really a miracle that i found the story at all because they're just so humble they just weren't the kind of guys that wanted to crow they just did what they thought they had to do that was the and, point that, that you know how could so many words how could we not respond to this exactly. yeah now, remember, they're taking the entire hospital's staff and everybody's lives into their own hands. You know, the risk was, I mean, there's so many stories I did that I researched about Rome. Like there's um, these 10 Roman mothers broke into an SS bakery because Rome was really, I mean, I, I hope I characterize it how bad it was. And that's one of my later questions, but go, go for it now. So, I mean, there was a case where these 10 mothers broke into an SS bakery and stole flour, wheat, and yeast so they could make bread for their children. The SS found out about them, lined them up on the Tiber, made them look on the river and machine gun. So, you know, these guys were, you know, I'm, I don't need to tell you how bad the Nazis were, but it, when, when I'm doing my little corner, my little story about it, like the threat of how bad it could have gotten for everybody had they found out this is, right. we can't even imagine it because they're, what they were capable of is nothing that we ever want to imagine anyway. And they, they so did it, you know? Right. So um, it just makes it all the more extraordinary to me. So, so let's dig a little bit into the story. Um, I think you set the stage nicely in terms of what Rome was like, the Jewish quarter, which I've been to several times. And I'm a little chagrined to say that I've walked along the river by that hospital, yeah. I, I think at least a dozen times on different trips there, just going back and forth. There's usually an open market on Sundays that sell all kinds of stuff along the river and you're right there. But I never thought to ask the question, besides I saw it was a hospital, what, what happened there? Yeah, yeah. 
it is remarkable. And it's remarkable, the proximity. Yeah, uh, right across the river. Across. Right there. Like it, it's literally 200 meters. There's one yeah. little bridge yeah. and you're there, you know. And we walked it a bunch of times when we were filming and it's like, wow, okay, I get it. I get what they want. It was kind of cute how you had that uh, cartoon of the, the trucks, the Nazi trucks getting lost <laughs> and walking around yeah. and then giving them an extra 30 minutes to... Uh, to prepare and, for you know, it's food. funny we were shooting that and you know we we it, uh, there's so much serendipity in this film i would i could spend two hours telling you about all the serendipitous things that happened but one of them was i have a neighbor who lives literally around the corner from me who owns a world war ii a troop carrier truck and he parked he's parked it in front of i've lived here for 20 years and it's parked in front of his house he drives it around for for just for giggles and so we wanted to recreate that scene where the guys are driving in the truck and the you know, yeah. the SS officers howling at the other guy and they're all pissed off because they're lost and they're trying to hunt down the Jews and they can't because they can't find where they are in Rome. And then it buys the guy's time and, you know, the whole story. And so I went over, and I didn't know him. I just see him every day. I don't know the guy. So I went like, hey, you know, would you mind if we borrowed your truck and turned it into a Nazi truck and <laughs> put a bunch of SS guys in there? And he goes, sure, take it. It's fine. <laughs> so we went to my, where I live on my bluff right here. And we hired the actors who were playing the two guys suited them up in the SS costumes, put a swastika on the side of this U.S. Army carrier and stuck them in there and filmed them driving around Rome so that we could try to create, you know, on yeah. a low budget, the sense of uh, them being lost. So, you know, my kids came home and they go, Dad, what's that truck with the swastika on it? Get that thing out of my yard right now. <laughs> and so, you know, we did it. We shot. We had no permits. It, you know, we just, we ghettoed it. We shot it. We you know, put them back in the house, took their clothes, took their, you know, uniforms off and took them back to the rental place. And it was just like, it's crazy how all that worked out. So. so, so that's an interesting, let me segue off of that for a second. So what are, if there are such thing as rules, what are the rules as you shoot a documentary like this about, you want to get as much raw footage and you, you, you sort of stumbled into the show of um, sort of archives that made it right that was really about your anchor but then you have the i guess for lack of a better word poetic license to do a little recreation like the guy running around the corner or maybe even the typewriter uh, mm -hmm. that that recurs throughout the film oh, yeah, that's that's my that's me typing on a <laughs> right when you were in rome in 1943 right exactly. and uh, and so what uh, help us understand uh, how you um or do justice to the story, but you're sort of recreating it. It's not really a docudrama directly because you're not doing the whole story. What, what, what rules do you follow when you do that? Well, I think the rule we sort of follow is we want to do as much authenticity as we possibly can. And we want to tell the story and it's clear, you know, we always have to think, I always think what the doc is like, the audience is going to see it one time. I've seen it a thousand times. So we want to do the best job we can with a combination. There's almost precious little footage of that time. So yeah. we start there with the authentic stuff and then we work our way up. So um, if you notice some of the black and white recreation stuff is actually from a very famous movie called Rome Open City, which was um, um, Rossellini directed. It was the first big American, first, first big film that was shipped from Italy to the United States to the cinema and uh, really paved the way for the spaghetti westerns. It, 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 that film really had a lot of right. history. And it was shot right after the occupation was over, shot in 46. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we licensed some of that because it's the closest we could get, even though those are recreations. It's, you know, from the okay. period. So, you know. So, so in other words, it's kosher to do that. Uh, as long as you're, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're filling, like you said, you're filling in the gaps so that the story can be told. The story can be told. That's the biggest thing. And we've got the authentic people that were there telling us the story. Yeah. So that gives us a lot of license because we're listening to the people that, you know, the, the, the next generation is, you know, Dr. Borromeo's son is telling us the story. Now he's very articulate, but it, you know, Dr. Borromeo senior died in 61. He died before right. I was born. Right. So that, was, um, that, that I'm sure for the son was, uh, cathartic in a way that that he could honor his father uh, and and create a, a lasting memory of of the great work that his dad did back yeah then. and i'm just so sorry he didn't you know he passed away a week after ozacini passed away that's they right. both died literally within a few days of each other that's right. um and i'm really sorry they couldn't see the film the two 
Roman Jews are still around, yeah. doing great. So they'll get to see it. Um, and uh, interestingly, Dr. Ozicini, his daughter is a physician at Fatih Bene Fratelli to this day. So she's practicing there. So that's wow. cool. She'll get to see it. And there's, you know, there's a big family of Ozicinis, lots of Ozicinis floating around. That's awesome. Well, let me segue away from, uh, from process to go into a little bit of the content. Uh, let me start with Pope Pius. Um, as a Jew, um, I've always had the impression that Pope Pius was uh, evil when it came to Jews in Rome or Jews in the world. And, and my understanding of his background was that um, he was consigned at some point to Germany uh, in the 20s or 30s and then was appointed Pope. And, and he, that he was almost deliberately, this is my prior impression before I saw the film, that he was deliberately um, turning against Jews, trying to turn them in. But, but based on your account, that really wasn't the case. He was trying just to keep peace and keep the Vatican City from being overrun with the German army. Mm -hmm. That's 100% my, uh, my impression. You know, there's, um, I talked to a lot of people there and, like, for example, one of the Papal Palace, which is basically Camp David, you know, the, our president has a Camp David he can go to, and there's a palace, and I forget the name of it, but it's... It's right next, yeah. It's someplace that he can drive to, and it's this beautiful... Well, there were, there were Jews hiding there. Oh. So if there were Jews hiding there, and it's Pope Pius's vacation spot, and yeah. he didn't want him there, he would have, you know, booted him out. But, you know, he had such a thin line that he had to skate on yeah. um, because he was trying to, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty apparent that he hated Hitler, um, that he hated what he was doing, that he knew what he was doing, yeah. but the reprisals of speaking out were already so severe yeah. that he had to be really careful politically about what he said. So, and also you had to protect Rome because, you know, think about, and I think I talked about this in the film a little bit, about Kesslering, which was the, the yeah. field marshal he sent in to occupy Rome, had destroyed Rotterdam, literally burned it to the ground when he left. You did so, say. you know, yeah. So like, well, okay, well, this guy just did that two months ago to another city. What's going to stop him? And apparently Rome was pretty wired up to yeah. blow it up. So he was trying to protect himself. He was trying to protect the you know Vatican City, which is obviously a separate state, and he's trying to protect Rome, and he's trying to protect the church, and he's trying to protect the Roman citizens, including the Roman Jews. Yes. Um, and you know, obviously, the Roman Jews had a target on their forehead because they deported a thousand of them within yeah. sixteen days of arrival. So we knew what they were. You know, they knew what they were trying to do, and then they made it real apparent. And you know, eighty percent of the Italian Jews survived the war which, you know, you can't say for Poland, you can't say for a lot of other people. I wasn't aware of that fact either. And I, I think what, just as a coming in with my preconceived notions about Pope Pius, I will say that as a subtext of the, the film, you, you kind of converted me to an understanding that he wasn't all evil. And I think the scene that really just sealed it was as uh, Rome was getting liberated and you have the, uh, quote, priest, with dancing sandals. Um, and, and I thought to myself, all right, all right, that could not have happened. They could have not have had that many Jews cloistered in churches, posing as priests um, without Pope Pius's blessing of sorts. It couldn't have happened. No way. There's just no way. He would never have allowed it. He would have just said, here, take them. Yeah. And here's another interesting story, which I didn't get to put in the doc because we, we wanted to end it at liberation because yeah. it's one of the good, you know, there's so many bad, bad, bad stories. And this story has, at least on some level, a nice, a nice arrival and a nice ending. And the Americans come in. And I had plenty of people in Rome say, you know, we're still so thankful the Americans came in. And it's like, wow, you guys are awesome. Um, but Pius XII was friends with Rabbi Zoller. Rabbi Zoller was the, the chief rabbi of Rome in the 40s. And um, I think they were like, you know, having Brunello and eating pasta buddies like they would hang out mm. and the really interesting thing is after the war Rabbi Zoller converted to Catholicism wow. uh, I, I don't know the exact story I have to google it again but I didn't put it in the movie but obviously that was a controversy for the for the Roman Jews that were left behind which is a significant population but right. um, 
you know, there was a there was a bond between those two. Now, obviously, converting to Catholicism is a really radical thing for the chief rabbi of Rome to do, but that was his decision. And let's just remember, he was free to do that because the Nazis got kicked out. Um, obviously, if the Pope had converted to Judaism, it would have created, you know, a huge, you know what I'm saying, if it had been the opposite. It right, would have been, right. you know, everybody was like, oh my God, I can't believe you. Yeah. Converted, you know. But it's just, I think it's really interesting how, you know, that yeah. relationship was there. That's fascinating. And yeah. I, to, just to the audience right now, uh, I'm going to ask one more question. We're about 20 minutes into this. And uh, then I would like to relay the questions from the audience. So if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you. And then um, uh, you got to unmute yourself to ask. And I'm sort of torn for my last question between going into the syndrome, but I think you explained that pretty well. The, the other thing that I couldn't quite reconcile as I watched this, just thinking historically, you did an incredible job of pointing out the degree of poverty and starvation that was happening throughout Rome owing to the occupation. Mm -hmm. And so the first thought I had or was, was thought, well, how did the hospital keep people fed? Because they have these, you know, 50 or so people on this uh, K ward, um, and and they had to be fed somehow, and they couldn't go out in the community into a bread line. So did you get any, did you develop an understanding of how that worked inside the hospital, where the food came from, or, or all the whole thing, for that matter? That's a really good question. I think probably what happened is maybe there was even with the German authorities, some sort of cooperation that, uh, you know, the hospital Hospitals somehow could, got rationed okay. something better. And, and, I mean, think about fuel for ambulances, you know, all right. that. Right. So there was a little bit of humanity, but not. Maybe, uh, yeah. I mean, support. yeah, I don't, yeah. Mm. So I never gave them the term humanity. You're right. That was too generous. So you know, I'll because they sent them back. And, you know, the woman from the Holocaust Memorial said, you know, the, the, the Nazis were or the German soldiers were polite. Like, really? Like, right. what? What are you talking about? Like, OK, they were polite. They, they wouldn't just go up and, you know, blast a Roman when they're walking down, you know, via Tasso heading to the market with you know pasta in there you know what i'm saying but let's be clear about what they were doing and what they stood for and you know right I'm trying to kick them out so, so i'm going to keep going here if you have a question please raise your hand uh through the zoom mechanism so let's uh let's start talking a little bit about syndromes and maybe i'll take it for the first part uh, from a medical definition what a syndrome is is a constellation of symptoms um, that indicates there's something going on, but the cause isn't uh, noted. I, I, I'll call it the, uh, for what it's worth syndrome, referring back to a Buffalo Springfield song where it goes, there's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Huh? And so think back to HIV, or really at that time it was AIDS. That was the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So it was a series mostly at that time of young gay men who were coming down with unusual opportunistic infections and malignancies for which there was no other explanation. So the syndrome was created that had a definition of the type of symptoms that would be there and uh, the cause wasn't known. COVID, what we're going through right now, would be a syndrome but for the fact that we have the causative agent. So it becomes COVID disease caused by a virus called SARS-CoV-2. So that's how different things have evolved. But back in the, even the 80s for us with AIDS, but certainly going back to the 40s, it was fairly common for people to classify things as syndromes when they couldn't define them as a, with a causative agent. Um, so I thought it was pretty clever of the, um, of the doctors and the pseudo doctors who were doing this to, to create that. And I think you did a nice job in the film of explaining why the Germans might be afraid of this, because what people forget about wartime is that a lot of, in fact, in most wars, the biggest casualty, cause of casualty is infection. Uh, go back to the Civil War, people got shot, but they really died of sepsis from their wound. And so that's where cleanliness in the military becomes such an obsession, because that keeps uh, common infections down. So for a military person to be concerned about an infection uh, makes all the sense in the world. That's what they're concerned about. And I think your documentary said it clearly right at the beginning that um, 
well, those, those Jews are sick and they're going to die anyway, so we don't want to expose ourselves to them. So tell me what, you, what else you could learn about the whole notion of this artificial syndrome, uh, syndrome K, as you did your research. Well, it's interesting. It's, in Italian, it's called morbo di capa, which is kind of like death by K. Or morbo oh. is like, it's, it's yeah, got yeah, a yeah. word morbid and death in it. Mm-hmm. Syndrome is a little more cleanliness. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a little more less threatening. Syndrome just means like, uh, I, you know, it, death by K sounds yeah. different than syndrome K to me, you right. know? Right. Um, so, I mean, I think what the doctors did is they tried to figure out a way to, to create this sort of amalgam of, of symptoms that they can sell. Mm-hmm. So the coughing, the, you know, the nausea, plus all that sort of undefined scary stuff right. is kind of like, and I think you as a physician, like, you know, if you're going to put together this cocktail that's, that's completely fake, Right. There's certain things you can, you can, you know, you can show and mm-hmm. there's certain things that you can't show, you know, you can't show so- sores. You have to say it's some sort of, you know, bug. Yeah. And so yeah. coughing easy. Um, you, you can even induce vomiting. Um, if you want diarrhea is more difficult, yeah. uh, but, but I think you can certainly do that. And they sounds like they, they did a pretty good job. One thing to dig into a little bit that I couldn't get complete clarity on You said uh, the film showed it towards the end that the Nazis were kind of catching on that something may not be right there. Did you get a sense of what it was or what led them to sort of become suspicious? Um, The feeling I got from interviewing the guys was that um, there was just a bunch of, there was a bunch of Jews in the hospital and they were kind of staying there and they weren't getting better and they weren't getting worse and there were no death certificates and so it's like, why are they there? And then, but we're still scared of it. And I think the saving grace was the fact that the, occupa- the occupation only lasted for nine months. So as the time was ticking along, the, you know, the... Um, yeah, there weren't any bodies coming out. No. There weren't any bodies coming out. But the news kept getting worse and worse for the Germans because the Allies, and I tried to sure. show the, you know, the charge from Salerno, well, really from North Africa to Sicily, that's jumping right. across the channel to Salerno right. and working their way up to Rome from the soft underbelly from the from below, which has you know never been done, right. and just the you know just the huge cost of this of this you know how bloody this campaign was. People don't think about it, and then think about what happened June fourth. Rome was taken over. June sixth was D Day. Yeah, two days later. Right. So that was not a good week for the Nazis. Let's right. just put it that way. So they lost their the, the first capital fell. And then they just got pounded from the north. And then, you know, it took another 14 months. Yeah. And it, 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 right, it, took, it took some time. And, and then we, and a lot of lives. Yeah. And by, I think just by most accounts, um, the Germans were really in trouble at, towards the beginning of 44. They were kind of holding it together. But the two fronts were starting to take its toll. And a lot of the stories about pre and post D-Day really underscored that, but I thought you did a nice job of showing how once the that sort of line was breached, that they just made a quick retreat uh, to the north and, and got out. And remember, too, that we took over the uh, airfield in Foggia, which is on the other coast, and so uh-huh. we had complete air superiority, and we were just pounding them relentlessly from the air, and they had no defense for it, so we were strafing. I mean, and, you know, the cost is the U.S. Air Force destroyed a lot of the Italian infrastructure trying to boot the Germans out. Yeah. It's really sad. I mean, you, I, sh- I don't think I, I didn't talk about the, uh, the uh, Monte Cassino, did I? I can't even remember if I talked about it. Monte Cassino is a famous monastery on a hill. It's 40 miles south of Rome. And we bombed it because the Germans were in there. Uh, destroyed it. Just destroyed yeah. the place. It's rebuilt now. But like yeah. a lot, you know, bridges. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. it's... Yeah. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a, you know, it's the, um, it's a more than just collateral damage. It's just the damage of war. And a lot of times, uh, the German troops would hide out in, in churches and places that they figured would not get allied bombing. Yep. It was a strategy they used. Um, still looking for some questions, but I'll keep going. Um, help me understand a little bit more about the geography. So the hospital, uh, sort of on this island in the river. 
was it actually a part of the Holy See? Is it part of the Vatican City? Is that that's correct? Also, so it's an extraterritorial Vatican property, right? Um, it actually isn't anymore. I don't forget what happened, but they they switched back over. Interestingly, I knew about extraterritorial Vatican properties before I did this film because in my life as a musician, when I did the first movie I did called Requiem for My Mother, the performance we did was in St. Ignatius of Loyola, which is one of the big basilicas in Rome. But it's oh. actually, a, it's, even though it's not in Vatican City, it's actually a Vatican property. So we had to get permissions from the city of Rome, but we also had to get permissions from Vatican City yeah. be, to do the concert, to film and all that stuff. So I knew about extraterritorial, but you hear Dr. Sacerdoti talks about it like, yeah, we were extraterritorial. So the order, the, the really the order that the Nazis had was you really weren't allowed to go into Vatican City. So it sort of gave them a little more level of protection because when they go in, they have to have permission, they have to ask, you know, it's a little less like they can just, they can't just storm in like they could in another part of Rome. Yeah, and I, I would love to talk to a, a, a Catholic scholar, which I'm sure there are hundreds of thousands, but just to see if there are papers, going back to this Pope Pius XII uh, again, um, to see if there are records, if there are writings where he's, journals where he's writing down that his intent, perhaps, of keeping the hospital as a haven, right. the, 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 the chapels and the churches uh, for Jews posing as priests, uh, I think it does cast him, like I said earlier, in a totally different light, certainly than I ever thought of him. And, you know, the, let's remember also, the, the Pius XII archives are opening up as we speak. Oh. So the Vatican has decided to um, open up its, its huge and huge amounts of documents. It's, it's rooms full of documents. So scholars are now getting access to go through all that stuff. Right. And, and I was thinking to myself, like, before I made the doc, I said, okay, well, what if it's true that he was really a scumbag and he really did hate the Roman Jews? Yeah. And then I, I was like, okay, let's just, for argument's sake, say that's true. It makes the story even more extraordinary because now these doctors are also going against the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and this is a, this is a Catholic hospital, and they're obviously disobeying even orders from the very top. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, okay, well, whatever story comes out, and I, I have a feeling it's going to be a story of him, sort of a, a, a subtle compassion and a, and a, right. and a more of a, by his actions rather than him speaking out. That's my conclusion so far, unless somebody drops a bomb. Yeah, so, so, so. so not quite Neville Chamberlain, but right. um, yeah, but sort of more of a, more of a strategic approach uh, for survival. For survival um, of Rome, for survival of the v Vatican archives, for uh, in the riches of the Vatican and, and the buildings and the city and himself and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to take a few more minutes, but just to continue this thought, the other thing that I was intrigued by uh, was um, uh, the, the Secretary of State for the Vatican who became Pope Paul later, correct? Paul VI. Uh, Paul VI. Yep. And, and he seemed to be playing in a more assertive role in this by creating fake documents and things that really enabled this. So that's the other thing that sort of, I thought, validated Pope Pius being, you know, somewhat complicit in the, in the protection, because how in the world could the Secretary of the Vatican be issuing all this without some tacit right. understanding or sign off by the Pope? It would have been a severe reprisal. And remember, the church has its own court system, canon law. So he would have probably, if he was doing something wrong, he probably would have been tried in that, and, in that court, you know, who knows? later became Pope. So he later became Pope. So they, yeah. would have, they would have blackballed him way before 1958 when he became Pope. But, um, you know, he, Montini and Borromeo Sr. were buddies. Yeah, yeah. So that helped a lot. I mean, they again, they're probably you can imagine them sitting down with a with a pasta and a brunello, like, what are we gonna do? You know, it's like this is what's in front of us. They're here. What what the hell are we gonna do with these people? I just can't right. imagine what that conversation must have been like. It's just right. fascinating. Well, I think our time is about up. Um, I'll see if there doesn't look like there's any questions. Folks are maybe a little bit shy. That's fine. I certainly had enough uh questions to dig into, but uh, just to kind of begin a wrap up, um, just, just from this conversation alone, 
uh, I think there are so many levels to what this film is about. There's obviously the primary story, which a lot of us, myself certainly included, did not know about this uh, fake syndrome, this plague. And by the way, not to interrupt you, but we walked around the Jewish ghetto of Rome and talked to elders who have lived there their entire life who had never heard of Syndrome K. Ah. So it's so funny, like, I tell people the story, I go to a festival or something, Syndrome K, you know, three doctors made up a fake disease, saved Jews in Rome, and they're like, I've never heard of it. Like, you've never heard of it. I talk to people who live 200 meters away their whole life, and their families have been there for 2,000 years, and they've never heard of it. So, like, somebody, a, a physician of your you know, yeah. accomplishment in Birmingham, Alabama, how in the world would you have known about it? Except I for the know. film, right? And like I said earlier, I walked by that hospital many times on yeah. business of Rome. So, by thought. the way, did you have the boiled asparagus? Time it'll be a different vision. So I think the, the original premise of the film, you know, holds true and the interviews really are quite powerful and validate, and especially not just what happened, but a lot of the motivation for the bravery, the what else could we do? We had to, they were compelled. I thought that stood on its own. But as we spent a lot of time here in our discussions just today, the, the, the other sort of deeper ripples, if you will, of the story in terms of the Nazis and how they operated in Rome and how they operated overall, the fear that it created that we knew about, but seeing it becomes even more real, the degree of starvation that was there And then the Catholic Church's formal response and the undercurrent of that or the underbelly of that, which was did seem like it was much more favorable towards Roman Jews than I ever appreciated before. And I I don't know if that was fully your intent, but it certainly came through in a big way. It certainly came through to me. And if it had been the opposite, I would have told that story. Yeah. Um, but my impression from the research I've done, and I did a pretty deep dive, and some people still disagree with me, and there's a lot of stuff that happened that's not so honorable, you know, the rat line, and there's all this other stuff that happened afterwards that I'm right. not too thrilled about. But in this case, all the evidence to me points to compassion, um, cunning, cleverness, mm-hmm. opportunity, and basically just flipping the bird to the Nazis, which <laughs> makes me so happy. Yeah, no, so we, have, we do have one question here from Eliana. Um, she, yes, you have to, uh, Eliana, you'll have to unmute and then you'll be able to uh, speak with us. Ah, there you are. So please go ahead, Eliana. Uh, I wanted to find out what's your Italian connection okay. and, what, and what's your Jewish connection, if any. Great question. Um, I'm raised Roman Catholic and my mother was Sicilian, so I'm actually a citizen of Italy and have sort of fallen in love with Italy, uh, adopted Italy, and I don't know, Eliana, if you heard, but my first documentary film was also made in Rome, and I had no intention of making another one in Rome. It was the furthest thing from my mind until this story literally came across my lap, but, uh, you know, I come from a, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and there's a very vibrant Jewish community there, so I'd always been around that community and knew these, you know, went to school with these people, was friends with these people, um, you know, just, they were always sort of part of my life, college. Uh, I went to Interlock and music camp when I was a kid. So, I, I mean, I was always embraced by the community, never expecting ever in the, my wildest dreams to make a Holocaust documentary. I was like, you know, maybe write the music for one or something, but I just, it just never even occurred to me that something a, a story this good would fall into my lap. And actually now we're also trying to make a Hollywood feature film based on the same story. So we have a script, we're sending it literally as we speak to directors. And um, in some ways it makes almost a more compelling movie than it does a doc because you can tell the story from the beginning. Right. You can really like, you know, you think about who would play Kapler, you think about who would play Borromeo and it's just like, oh, you just like, yeah. It just makes you like, wow, this could be so good. So we're aggressively right now, and it's nice now we have a doc. So a director who's interested in the story, we should just say, hey, watch the doc. Here's the real people. Is this yeah. something you want to do? Well, I'm thinking about tying it all together since you mentioned Spaghetti Westerns, which were filmed there. In the 60s, you could bring Clint Eastwood as the both director and actor for some of, some of the parts, perhaps. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So we're going to have to wrap up. Um, Steve, I'm going to let you have the last word. Um, what what would you um, how would you like to sum up uh, 
uh, your entire experience with this and what you hope people walk away with? Well, you know, it's a great pleasure to make this film and I had a blast making it and I used the same, a lot of the same team I used in my first film. And now the great part is I sort of get this, you know, this sort of karmic reward of being able to share it in festivals and, you know, people like you that didn't know the story and they're like, and, you know, there's nothing better than a secret story of a Holocaust that's a, that has a little bit of hope in it because those are like, those are gold. Those are almost impossible to find. And I found one and I'm very fortunate. And now all I want to do is share it with the world and speak to you people and, and show you what happened and show it to you as a filmmaker and to share the story and to just, you know, give you a little piece of good news, especially now. And the weird thing is making, I was talking to Doc about this before we started, making a film about a fake disease in the middle of a pandemic. Like, what are the chances of yeah. that? And of course, when I started the movie, there was no COVID-19. Right. But then when I finished the movie, you know, I'm supposed to be going to these festivals. I actually went to the Miami Jewish Fund Festival in January, and then all the other festivals we're doing, we're doing on Zoom. So that's wow. fine. I still don't mind sharing it. So. Well, thank you so much for, A, making the movie and then making the time to share your thoughts with us. I think it adds a, a really important dimension to understanding the depth and the messaging of, of the film. And congratulations on great work. And my thanks to the uh, Miami Jewish Film Festival for making this happen and for inviting me to participate. I think we'll wrap Thank up you. There. And I'm glad to tell the story. It's a story that needs to be told. And thanks all for joining me. It's a yeah. pleasure to be with you. Amen. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.